Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It's been an interesting week in the markets. Not especially volatile, but not real clearly one directional either. We're going to talk about why that is. As far as uh, tax reform, um, I, I gotta. if you're bored of the subject, I apologize. we got to kind of talk about all of that again, because certainly since last week, there's been significant updates. So we'll go through that a little, talk big picture market. I want to close with a kind of major takeaway um, that I think is a, a permanent sort of evergreen truth that will be important in the uh, present landscape, per, particularly as we kind of think about portfolio positioning as 2017 is coming to an end and we get ready for where we want to take things into 2018. So yes, the Senate in the middle of the night, Friday going on Saturday of last week, did uh, pass their tax reform bill. Um, there wasn't anything particularly shocking about that. Um, we, we very much expected that was going to happen. And the markets began to expect that late last week as well. I think you know last week was the biggest week in the market all year. And things uh, kind of looked like they'd even continue more into Monday. It kind of ended up giving a lot of those gains back. But we've had a couple up days this week, a couple down days, nothing real significant. But um, I would not be surprised to see a little bit of sell-off, uh, maybe even in early January. I mean, just based on that old market adage of selling the news, there's been a lot of anticipation. Our focus right now around the tax reform bill, first and foremost, is we need to see the final, final bill. I um, am quite confident that the president's signature will be on a tax reform bill by the end of this year. And that that bill is going to look very similar, though not identical, to the Senate bill that was just passed. The House bill and the Senate bill are now in conference, which means they have to kind of reconcile the two bills together. There are some who thought that the House was just going to rubber stamp exactly what the Senate did. And I think that that is not going to happen in a literal sense, but it's going to be very similar. There will be some minor tweaks that the House is successfully implements. I don't think they'll be significant or substantive. Um, hopefully, a couple of the things that they get done are improvements as, as we would see it. From a market standpoint, I believe that um, the bulk of the very good news is now known, which is the business tax reform side, um, it's not as favorable of repatriation conditions as we had hoped for, but the massive reduction in the corporate rate and, and the territorial tax system and the instant expensing, uh, basically full accelerated depreciation, I think is, is extremely bullish for equity markets and obviously the stock markets responded accordingly. Uh, the key is not to say who's going to benefit the most from an investor standpoint. It's who's going to benefit the most that maybe it has not fully been appreciated or realized yet. And our thesis is that the financial sector is going to benefit a great deal from this and other fiscal and deregulatory um, and administrative policy uh, conditions. However, a lot of that has certainly been priced in. The financials have, have grown leaps and bounds since the Trump administration came into office. Where we might say that we see unappreciated opportunity would be in the small and mid-cap sectors, a lot of domestic companies that basically just got a major increase to their cash flow because the corporate tax liability is at a 35% level, coming down to 20%, even if they end up at 22%, a significant reduction in tax liability. And these are not primarily the companies that have been benefiting from a lot of the deductions and loopholes and, and depreciations, allowances, and things of that nature that are going away. So we think that they have the most significant improvement in their effective corporate tax rate. And um, I don't believe that that's been fully appreciated in the markets. Um, I do have a section at DividendCafe.com this week talking about what companies are going to do with this improved cash flow, big cap and small cap. Um, there's obviously a net increase in earnings per share when there is a decrease in tax liability. And there's debate over what's best for the economy from a policymaker standpoint, what they most want them to do. I don't engage that debate as much because I believe market forces are the best uh, adjudicator as to how additional free cash flow ought to be 
spent. And so if they choose to do stock buybacks, if they choose to do dividend payments, or if they choose to hire more employees, uh, 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 pay employees more money, or invest into more CapEx, factory building, inventory buildup, uh, new technology, things of that nature. Everything I just listed, I think, is beneficial to the economy, but um, some are more politically uh, beneficial than others. All of them, though, are beneficial to us as investors. So I think it's stimulative and it's pro-growth. And to the extent that some people don't get excited about stock buybacks or dividend payments, the reality is from an investor standpoint, those would be considered beneficial as well. So that's a win-win. Um, the high yield bond sector is a potential loser in this, uh, right? As it stands now, we will see how it nets out in the end, but they uh, cap the deductibility of corporate debt relative to a percentage of earnings. Um, so that could make the, the corporate borrowing a bit less attractive. Um, the energy sector, we think benefits in this tremendously. They're the second highest effective tax rate sector and uh, between the full expensing on equipment and capital expenditures and the um, reduced tax rate, we think the energy sector is an unappreciated beneficiary. Companies that have done these little cute tax inversions into foreign domiciles, we think are gonna be the big losers. Um, and really interest rates ought to rise out of this. Um, across the yield curve, that steepening yield curve helps the financial sector and then we think uh, probably longer duration treasury bonds would, would suffer from this. Um, but uh, all that to say, we to really fully analyze it, it, it's at this point kind of silly conjecture. We know exactly what the areas are they're still trying to nail down. Will the corporate tax rate kick in in 2018 or 19? Um, will it be at 20% or 22%? We have, by the way, heard talk about letting it come in at 25% in 2018, then getting down to 20% in 2019. Not sure how much money that really saves, but all those types of things we're looking at. Bottom line, a pretty mumble jumble individual income tax improvement, certain little things on the margin. For example, uh, Senator Cruz uh, got in with a tie-breaking vote from Vice President Pence an adjustment to 529s, which a lot of our clients use for college savings, tax-free college savings, to allow them to now be used for K through 12 uh, school funding for those uh, private school tuition from kindergarten through high school. So those are things that have kind of a practical significance, but aren't big needle movers in the macro economy. So those are the things we'll report to you on when we get the final version. So yes, tax reform is happening. Yes, uh, there's still some things to work out. And we think we've kind of divided here for you where we believe the biggest winners and losers are, other than the fact that mostly all risk assets have been and will be winners. In terms of my kind of take, my closing thought for you, what I want you to take away going into the weekend, I uh, borrowed heavily from a mentor of mine, Nick Murray, in, in this, but it's worth repeating because I'm seeing it right now. I'm dealing with it. I'm counseling clients through it. We're positioning portfolios in spite of it or, or what have you. But we talk a lot about the unbelievable mistakes people make with either euphoric greed, um, buying into bubbles, buying into uh, momentum, believing certain things that have risk, don't have risk. And then we talk a lot about uh, panicky uh, fear and, and when that uh, causes people to sell things that they shouldn't be selling or not buy things they should be buying and how that balanced and, and very um, intentional process of asset allocation is what we do to mitigate both sides of those things. And we stick to that rigorously, even when the worst uh, extremes of fear and the worst extremes of greed can kick in. But I really believe that one thing Nick Murray says is very important. Neither fear nor greed are, are really the worst things that happen in an investor's emotional life. It's regret. Regret um, of things that they didn't sell, they wish they had. Regret for things that they did sell, they wish they had not. And then the accompanying decisions that come out of that regret. Um, a great example are those that were just so certain 
equity markets were significantly overbought a year ago. The things had come up. I heard the line. I've heard the line now 5,000 times. Oh, but we're at an all-time high. We're at an all-time high. And I heard that at Dow 16,000, 18,000, 20,000, 22,000, 24,000. Because they missed the point that valuations were not at an all-time high. Earnings were growing. So prices, of course, were making new highs. And that every number the market's ever been at was at one point an all-time high. Um, but then there was fear about the instability around the Trump administration and any number of reasons to not come into the market. So the regret that people missed a 25 or 30 percent move up in equity markets um, it then causes them to avoid allocating capital the way they ought to. There should be no delay in optimal allocation of capital. No, I'll wait until this waiting for a dip that then ends up coming and at the bottom of that dip represents a price significantly higher than all the numbers people missed along the way. It's bad investing. It's bad behavior. And by the way, it's bad even if you accidentally get it right, which very rarely happens. But even when one's timing happens to coincide with opportunistic price movements and their own buy-sell decisions, um, it's a recipe for disaster. If anything, that emboldens people to believe they actually have some hidden intuition about market movements and causes them to uh, be more reckless into the future. Regret is an enemy of investing. The only thing to do, uh, regardless of what mistakes have been made in the past, is to do the right thing today. And the right thing represents a proper understanding of volatility, acceptability, and creating a risk-reward scenario through asset allocation around that, the blending of stocks, bonds, and alternatives to one's own timeline and risk horizon. So I've gone a little longer than I intended to on this, but it's such an important point. I'll talk to any one of you anytime about the subject. That's how important it is to us at the Bonson Group. I got to run. Have a wonderful weekend. USC, congratulations on your Pac-12 championship. Here we go. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for listening. Dividend Cafe.